the most infamous creepypasta to ever grace the internet, spawning endless drama, convoluted reboots and spin-offs, a bizarre fanbase, and multiple mysteries that would engross the entire internet. This is Jeff the Killer. I'm sure you all remember this story. A young Jeffrey Rudds is plagued by a mysterious feeling that manifests in a murderous rage after he and his brother Lou experience cartoonishly extreme bullying by three bullies, Randy, Keith, and Troy, who later retaliate by attacking Jeff, lighting him on fire after he's been covered in bleach, giving him his trademark ghastly pure white skin. The disfigurement turns Jeff totally insane, driving him to carve a permanent smile into his face and burn off his eyelids so he can always see how beautiful he is before brutally stabbing to death both his parents and then Lou before uttering his iconic catchphrase, go to sleep. Wait, that's it? Yeah, in retrospect it's a pretty funny story. It's clearly written by a teenager, likely 13, the same age as Jeff, and it shows little regard for logic, with Jeff inexplicably seeming to have superhuman strength, killing Randy by <laughs> punching him in the heart like he's Homelander or some shit. When his brother Lou gets blamed for Jeff's initial attack, he's sent directly to prison by a police officer without any evidence or trial. Jeff's bullies somehow own several firearms, and they have a John Wick style shootout with Jeff in front of countless adult attendees at a child's birthday party. But beyond plot holes, the story does basically nothing to establish its characters. Jeff himself apparently has a feeling, a strange feeling that makes him feel like he has to brutally attack and kill people, and characters speak and act uh, insanely bizarre at times. Like the scene when Jeff's mom sees him carving a smile into his face and her immediate reaction is to be like, honey, get the gun. Go anywhere on the internet and you'll find people laughing at the original creepypasta. And yeah, it's pretty easy to do so. But this story did have a huge impact on readers, including myself, all the way back in 2011. And it's not without merit. For one, the image of Jeff which accompanies this story is legitimately creepy, especially for the time, and even today I'd still say it's pretty effective. Even if it's overexposure and the quality of the story it's attached to has diminished that considerably. The story's setup introducing Jeff as some sort of mysterious cryptid-like serial killer from the perspective of a news article was a unique and captivating hook, and a creepypasta being more down-to-earth without any overtly supernatural elements, trying to be more of an origin story for a regular-ass slasher serial killer definitely helped it stand out within the creepypasta niche. And you can't deny that it's an insanely fun read. Uh, even if it's in the so bad it's good kind of way. Above all, I think the story exploded to the popularity it did because of how it catered to younger readers. Jeff the Killer has somewhat of a self-insert power fantasy angle. Despite his one-dimensional character, the idea of an angsty teenager that's whining about being dragged to a kid's birthday party, in between overpowering and taking revenge on his bullies like some kind of juvenile anti-hero, clearly appealed to the young adult demographic that was already invading the creepypasta community. Jeff is a lot easier to latch onto and understand for younger readers as opposed to something like Baraska or 1999 would be. Jeff the Killer brought with it, frankly ludicrous amounts of drama, right from the start. To begin with, that story we just went over, what I and pretty much everyone call the original, is not actually the first Jeff the Killer story. Nope, evidence quickly surfaced that the story was actually plagiarized from a creator named Sesuar, who uploaded a video explaining Jeff's original backstory years before the infamous pasta. It's presented in this very nostalgic Windows Movie Maker format, and in this version Jeff is already a serial killer before his disfigurement, and gets his injuries by walking into the bathroom holding a container of acid and uh, <laughs> slipping on a bar of soap. Uh, this Sesuar guy also claimed to have been the one to create the iconic Jeff image as well, claiming it was an unedited photo of him wearing a latex mask, but uh, that was just a straight up lie, with appearances of the image being found years before he claimed to have made it. Uh, which kind of makes me question his other claims of ownership over Jeff, but Anyways, back to the real story. The pasta saw a major backlash by the wider creepypasta community as soon as it was published, and the resentment was only emboldened, as it skyrocketed to become arguably the influential and most popular creepypasta of all time. This was, in large part, due to Jeff unexpectedly amassing a huge following of fangirls. The younger side of the creepypasta community was able to look past or perhaps not even notice the glaring issues with the pasta's writing, and latched onto Jeff's creepy visage along with his nihilistic attitude and relatable themes of bullying and rebellion. This fanbase however liked their interpretation of Jeff, not the character portrayed in the pasta. So in the countless fanfictions, animations, and pieces of art made of Jeff, he quickly began to morph into something very different. Jeff went from a horrifyingly disfigured sociopath 
to a misunderstood emo twink with eyeshadow instead of burnt out eyelids and notably understated scarring. Along with perfectly smooth white skin and a bad boy attitude, this new oddly lustful fanbase portrayed Jeff as a womanizing bad boy alcoholic who swore like a sailor and had a sensitive, sympathetic side hidden underneath his murderous tendencies. Obviously, different artists had different interpretations of Jeff, but this version is overwhelmingly the one represented in later fan works. And some of these new fans who became attached to Jeff decided they wanted to expand upon a simplistic world presented in the original pasta. Much in the way Slenderman's mythos was built by dozens of independent artists inspired by the original Something Awful shred, Jeff's story was continued in several hugely popular fan-made creepypastas with amateur writers introducing their own characters and lore to the Jeff the Killer universe. Okay, so there's a frankly absurd amount of spin-offs unofficial sequels, and uh, romantic works of the OG Jeff story. But for this video, we're just going to focus on the most popular of them that are generally considered canon. First is of course Jane the Killer. Much like Jeff, the sparsely documented history here is a little confusing, with there being multiple versions of the same character. Before the more well-known Jane Everlasting version that you're probably thinking of, there was Jane the Killer, Born of Science. And I feel the reason this was largely forgotten is because it's completely insane. In this version, we follow Jane Arkansas, who's just some regular chick that gets lulled into a government experiment where she's injected with something called liquid hate that turns her into basically a super soldier who can shapeshift and it turns her skin white for some reason. All for the purpose of killing Jeff, because apparently an emo 14 year old with a knife is just too much for the freaking US government to handle. Despite its crazy crackhead premise, the story itself takes forever to get there and is just really long and boring. But the concept of a genderbent, good version of Jeff was cool enough to get reworked into the infinitely more popular Jane the Killer The True Story. This similarly sets up its heroine as a sort of mirror rival for Jeff, with her being around for all the major events of the original Jeff the Killer story, just uh, conveniently slightly off screen. The first half is really boring to be honest. It's pretty much just a retelling of the original story, but from Jane's perspective, with her offering some really dry play-by-play -play commentary and not affecting anything. But it picks up after she witnesses Jeff's fight at the birthday party, with Jane actually being the one to save Jeff by running over with a fire extinguisher while he's burning to death. Oh wait, no, actually, seeing Jeff on fire freaks her out so much, she faints and then somehow manages to smash her head on the extinguisher she brought and gets sent to the same hospital as Jeff. <laughs> like, how do you mess up that bad? Actually, she faints like three separate times in this story. It happens again when she sees Jeff's burned face after he's discharged, and a third time near the end after he murders everyone, including Jane's parents in this version. This past has a really bad habit of having the story just sort of happen around Jane. She's quite a dull, passive protagonist, just being a bystander for everything. The only time she does something, she knocks herself out trying to help Jeff. There's also some kind of weird, maybe kind of romance subplot going on, with her friend group teasing her, saying she only saved Jeff because she had a crush on him, and Jane always denies it while blushing like an anime character. This doesn't lead anywhere, and it's really out of place tone-wise. Alright, I'm crapping on this one a lot, but I do really like how her encounter with Jeff is portrayed. When I woke up, I was at the dining room table. My knife was gone and I looked up and I saw people sitting at the table. It's my parents, Jeff's parents, his brother Lou, they were all dead. With smiles carved into their faces. Huge red cavities on their chest. The smell was unbearable. The smell of sure, it's pretty edgy, but it's decently effective imagery, at least to the same level as the pasta it's a spin off of. Anyway, after Jeff captures Jane, he says he wants to make her beautiful like he is, so he carves the Joker smile into her face and sets her on fire using bleach and alcohol. Only Jeff screws this up somehow and she just ends up having normal burnt skin. So the story concludes with her in the hospital receiving a package from Jeff as an apology for messing up her transformation, containing a white mask emulating Jeff's face, a knife, and a flower. So Jane sets out swearing to exact revenge on Jeff, taking the nickname Jane Everlasting, because, and I quote, For I want the only thing to be more everlasting for Jeff than his madness to be his death. Yeah, I know I was pretty harsh on this, but really, I do have to commend the story for how well it matches the feeling of the OG pasta. From the insane out of left field violence paired with Disney Channel dialogue, even down to grammatical errors, this has it all. With Jeff's character in particular being really one to one with the OG story, which is very appreciated with how much later spin offs will stray from it. And I do like the whole concept of a good version of Jeff hunting him down with her catchphrase being don't go to sleep. 
you won't wake up. It's really a perfect sequel to the point you could believe it was written by the same author. And of course, someone would eventually write a pasta where we get to see their epic fight. Jane the Killer vs Jeff the Killer Much like Jane, there are multiple versions of this story. Only the original legitimately seems to be like, lost media? I could not find it anywhere and it was nuked from creepypasta.net for reasons we'll get into later. But by far the most popular version is the rewrite by Mr. Creepypasta. It attempts to be an epic cinematic crossover and is pure cringe Kino. The Jane featured here is the better known Jane Everlasting version, but it does take the shape-shifting powers from the original, recontextualizing them as a deal with the devil she made. Okay. And this also displays the contemporary fanon version of Jeff most people think of. This version of Jeff is 10 years removed from his original murders, and he's much more anime, with lots of snarky one-liners. <laughs> you missed my throat. My face has plenty of holes in it as it is. Poor Jane the murderer. Parents are dead and she's going to bitch and whine. Your little knife. Fuck you! So yeah, this version is really awesome to be honest. It has the same unabashed cringe and insane structure that makes the others so enjoyable. The story opens with Jeff returning to his abandoned family home where he runs into Lou who's actually alive and says that he's forgiven Jeff. Later we see Jeff at a dive bar where he's propositioned by a hooker that is actually Jane using her shape-shifting powers and they actually sleep together. Uh, but wait, it was all a ploy so she could drug Jeff and capture him. I don't see why she couldn't have just done that before they did the deed, but okay. There's more stuff going on with Jeff murdering a babysitter and some cops that are investigating him, but it's ultimately inconsequential. We're all here to see the fight, and it does deliver. The story climaxes with Jane having Jeff tied to a chair, revealing to him that the visions of his family and the Lou he met earlier, as well as the hooker he slept with, were all Jane. And she goes to slash Jeff tied to a chair, but he manages to break free and the two of them have an extended knife fight, setting the house ablaze and it ends with Jeff's family actually appearing as ghosts, for real this time, and then they all attack and kill Jeff. The story flashes forward to a morgue with both their bodies, only Jeff's eyes open at the end so I guess he survived. But Jane actually did die for real. Not from Jeff, but from childbirth. Yes, from Jeff's kid. Holy moly. Alright, this is definitely the most out there of these. But if you ignore the whole Jane masquerading as a prostitute and having Jeff's kid thing, the story is really fun. Uh, yeah, it's plots all over the place, like Jane could have captured Jeff like five separate times and when she finally does she like totally screws it up, but the whole schlocky camp angle fits the characters super well. It's a really fun read and I'll say it's definitely a story that keeps you on your toes with all the insane twists it has. I know I'm kind of spoiling these but they're only quick summaries so if you find it interesting, you should definitely check out the official reading on Mr. Creepypasta's channel as it's pretty well put together with tons of guest voice actors. And man, I just love Jeff's characterization in it. Black eyes, that little smoke and mirrors trick. <laughs> you don't do what I do without seeing some shit, lady. Demons, monsters, tall motherfuckers in the woods. <laughs> oh yeah, Jeff's stories also tend to tie in with the Slender Man sometimes. Jeff the Killer vs. Slender Man. So some stories make Jeff one of Slender Man's proxies. Basically, people Slenderman controls as his puppets, and he lives with the other creepypasta characters who are also his proxies in the uh, creepypasta mansion, uh, but that's a whole other thing I am not getting into. But this story simply has Jeff and Slender exist in the same universe so they can have a sick Freddy vs Jason style fight. The story is essentially just Jeff drunkenly wandering around the woods, looking for a victim and coming across Slender. They fight because... You know, I don't know what the fuck you are, but you kind of remind me of myself. You've got a nice white face, but all you're missing is a smile. <laughs> the battle goes on for ages, with Slender using his tentacles and teleporting around as Chef chumps around the woods slashing and stabbing him like an anime character, dropping some cold one-liners. Is that the best you've got, Slendy? I've taken worse beatings from my father's belt than your weak twig arms. And he even chops off one of Slenderman's arms. Uh, the fight reaches its climax as Chef lights the forest on fire and ends up being thrown and impaled on a tree bench by Slender as he slips away, left to burn along with the forest. Although there is a short epilogue with a couple exploring the forest and coming across Jeff who's totally fine besides a few extra burns and then he kills him. There's very little story to analyze here, it's just pure fan service, but uh, it's an enjoyable read. So those are the three most popular spin-off stories. 
There are a few others worth mentioning that are either built off of or are straight copycats of Jeff. First would be Homicidal Lou, an alternate timeline where Lou survives Jeff's initial attack, and he has this kind of emo Frankenstein's monster look with all the crazy stitches from Jeff's attack, and he actually forgives Jeff and essentially goes crazy wanting to follow in his big brother's footsteps, also murdering people. But it's really just a retread of Jeff. Not too much to talk about here besides the design and general concept being pretty fun. Another super big one was Tiki Toby, which despite not being directly linked to Jeff, was one of the many copycat stories overtaking Creepypasta that was essentially just the same story. Some kind of misunderstood team that has a tragic backstory till they finally break and start killing their bullies slash family with a knife. Probably the most infamous of all these though, would have to be Nina the killer. This became pretty much the poster child for bad creepypasta stories and is a big part of what finally broke the camel's back with how oversaturated the community was getting with these young teenagers writing power fantasy fanfiction for their serial killer OCs. Nina being literally just a self-insert Jeff the Killer fangirl that's obsessed with the creepypasta and kills her bullies to emulate Jeff and this catches the attention of the real Jeff with the two of them basically becoming like boyfriend girlfriend. <laughs> So yeah, at this point with the Jeff imitators, Lost Episode, and .exe creepypastas, we had strayed so far from supernatural internet urban legends like Smile Dog or The Rape that the whole creepypasta genre had come to be seen as a complete joke by the wider internet, becoming synonymous with cringe fandom compilations, hyper-realistic blood, and laughably unscary subject matter. And the senior user base of creepypasta.com was not happy about this. They had seen their underground community of genuine internet horror a playground for incompetently written schlock that was totally taking over their community. To them, Jeff the Killer and his derivatives were a cancer threatening to kill Creepypasta from within. And a year after Jeff the Killer was published, the mods of Creepypasta.com decided to take down the story, claiming it didn't meet the site's quality standards. Initiating somewhat of a civil war between the pro and anti-Jeff camps, with the story repeatedly being uploaded and taken down again, culminating with an official poll being held to decide Jeff's fate. Proposal deletion of Jeff the Killer. Yes, you read the title right. I'm proposing the penultimate, permanent deletion of Jeff the Killer, a popular bad quality story that makes a mockery of our standards and defies belief with its popularity. Jeff the Killer's writing is atrocious. It uses a lot of awkward phrasing, grammatical errors, and it rapes a thesaurus, for lack of a better phrase. We have at least a dozen blogs by users who point out the flaws within the story. How do 12 year olds have guns? What the hell is a thing of bleach? Did you know that bleach is inflammable? And it takes more than just that bit of stuff happening to drive someone insane. It would already be long gone in the deletion log if it weren't for the fact that it was popular. We gave Sonic.exe the walk of shame treatment. For what reason is this story different? The pro Jeffers argued the story was simply too iconic and influential to be removed. Jeff had become like the creepypasta mascot, he was single handedly responsible for getting many into creepypasta in the first place and inspired countless to make their own stories. Even if they often weren't the best written, we all have to start from somewhere. Some even argued it equated to censorship and erasing internet history simply due to a couple of power tripping mods and jealous writers. In the end though, when the votes came in, it was decided that Jeff the Killer was to be wiped from creepypasta.net. After this, the story was bounced around, initially living on the troll pasta form, then being removed from there as well, and finally getting placed in the mockingly titled Just the Kittens.net. Essentially a containment zone for all the cringe Jeff spin-offs. But after creepypasta.net deleted the original Jeff story, a compromise was reached where a contest was to be held to create the official rewrite for the story that met the site's quality standards. The contest had strict rules to keep the pasta recognizable as Jeff the Killer, keeping the characters linked and general plot beats the same. Even within those strict limitations, there were several pretty good reimaginings written. Only one could come out on top though, and what was chosen to be the official replacement was Banning K's reimagining, simply titled Jeff the Killer 2015. It was published and met, at least initially, with overwhelming praise from the community. Banning K's version sticks very close to the original story, making everything flow much better and it removes any glaring logical errors. Although I do think it comes with its own problems that hold it back from surpassing the original for me personally. I know some people will call me a nostalgia blind freak for preferring the original mess over this technically much better crafted telling, but to see why let's get into the changes. First I have to give major props to the dialogue here. The story opens on Jeff and Lou discussing their new living arrangements and overall the dialogue is very impressively natural and realistic feeling, especially for two teenage boys. Lou teases Jeff about being an incel, and they mention how distant and unhappy their parents are. This is probably the biggest change to the story, 
Jeff's parents are heavily expanded upon compared to their one-dimensional OG counterparts. Not that that's a very high bar. Jeff's parents are comically terrible in this story. They're exceptionally closed off and dismissive of Jeff and Lou. They don't believe or even attempt to defend the boys' innocence after the cops are called to their place when they get in their initial fight with Randy and the other boys. This story obviously avoids Lou getting sent to freaking prison, but he does get sent to stay at their aunt's house as punishment further isolating Jeff and his lonely home life. From there, instead of being jumped at a party, Jeff's mom forces him to hang out at Randy's house to make up, as in this continuity, Randy is the son of the wealthiest man in town, who Jeff's dad works under. This quickly spirals into the tree bullies, holding Jeff at gunpoint with a flare gun so they can get their payback from kicking their asses early. And the flare gun is accidentally discharged, burning Jeff's faces in the original. In this version though, Jeff doesn't end up with his iconic white visage, but rather he has a realistic, severe burning to half his face, leaving one of his eyes a milky white foil. It's a much more disgusting description, if a tad more generic. Funnily enough, in its attempt to avoid Heat Ledger Joker comparisons, it ends up coming across as a knockoff of another Batman villain, heavily resembling Harvey Dent's Two-Face from the same movie. And even after this, Jeff's parents still only care about themselves, believing Randy's BS story of Jeff playing with the gun and shooting himself, and they're more so worried they'll lose social standing after the incident and have to spend time homeschooling Jeff. The ending's handled really well, honestly. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a psycho, the finale with Jeff murdering his parents is really awesome, especially with how hateable they're made in this version. And I love in the Mr. Creepypasta reading when Jeff's unofficial team song kicks in. It's pretty hype. The writing paints a vivid image. Jeff standing in front of his parents' bed, slowly approaching, knife in hand, each side of his face moving in and out of the dim light, switching between the face of a normal high school boy on one side and a disfigured, enraged monster on the other, before brutally gutting them both. Although the whole go to sleep catchphrase is kind of awkwardly shoved in here. It's also a nice change to not have Jeff murder Lou, as especially in this interpretation, it really doesn't have any justification. So when it comes to the problems with this version, there's really three big factors holding it back for me. First off would be the characterization of Jeff himself. The whole feeling that drives him to kill is just as vague and out of nowhere as in the original, even if it's dressed up in fancier prose. This version constantly refers to his bloodlust as a tasty syrup that Jeff just can't resist. And I'm sorry, but it just sounds really stupid and kind of takes me out of it. Especially with the dead serious approach the story takes. I also feel similarly to how Jeff's parents are handled. They're presented as completely irredeemable assholes with every sentence they speak, being either totally neglectful or straight up antagonistic to Jeff and Lou at every turn. They put their own social standing in the new town above their own kids' well-being. And sure, there could be parents like that in real life, but especially with how they show zero sympathy and even like annoyance after Jeff's disfigurements is just ridiculously evil to the point of being as heavy-handed and unnatural as the original. And that leads to the final and biggest criticism, and that's that this story feels like it wants you to like Jeff, or at least sympathize with him. Every turn of this story presents the world and Jeff's own parents as cruel and unfair as possible towards him to justify his murder spree at the end, and it frames Jeff like a righteous vigilante rather than an insane murderer. I don't think it's good to make a serial killer sympathetic in the first place, and it displays a similar misunderstanding to the original story's appeal as the quote unquote cringe fanbase that caused this whole deletion rewrite debacle in the first place. In the end, this version's technically better written in every way, but just isn't as entertaining or unique as the original, and I don't feel the sympathy the story's trying to force on me for a character that would do something as terrible as what Jeff does. Now I know I was really harsh there, but this is actually only a small part of Banning K's reimagining of Jeff the Killer World, as there are actually several direct sequels to this reboot. The sequels are free to do their own thing and are a big improvement in my opinion. They add up to a combined 10 plus hour read time and take a very unique and interesting angle on the world. Jeff himself is barely in these stories, and instead we focus and expand upon the living cast many years later. With Lou writing a book exposing the corruption in the police force's handling of the Jeff case, due to Randy's father's high up position in the town, as well as establishing what's essentially a cult that sees Jeff as a figure of rebellion against their unfair society, resulting in a string of copycat killers and naturally introducing fan favorite characters from the Jeff the Killer lore, like Jane the Killer and the infamous Nina the Killer, with their own fastly improved reimaginings. I personally haven't had the time to get through all of it, but if that interests you, it's pretty cool stuff. It's a solid crime thriller epic. Although the original Jeff the Killer story is pretty much universally maligned nowadays, I do think people still hold a little bit of nostalgia for it, particularly for the image of Jeff. You know, it's so weird and uncanny looking. I mean, it's clearly like a Photoshop, but of what? Well, evidently a lot of people thought that, as for years now, 
there has been a community dedicated to searching for the origin of the Jeff the Killer image. The hunt has become probably the biggest ongoing case of lost media online, with dozens of false leads and hoaxes. The topic has been discussed to death, so I'm not going to go over everything here, but I'll give the spark notes. Here's what we know for sure. First, the image obviously predates the well-known Chef the Killer creepypasta and even the OG Seswa version. Although, as mentioned earlier, Seswar did claim to have created the image himself, saying it was done with a white latex mask, but, but that was disproven when the image was found in a Japanese YouTube video uploaded all the way back in 2007. And after that, it was found Chef actually appeared a lot on the Japanese side of the internet, way before that, with several instances of this earlier version of the image being posted on various image boards. It's much goofier looking version, and the eyes almost certainly come from this Mr. Potato Head toy. Funnily enough, you can still partially see the Mr. Potato Head eyes in the uh, famous version that we know. So yeah, it seems Chef came from the Japanese internet, maybe 2chan, but really there's no major leads right now. AI has resulted in even more hoaxes, and even after Mudahar and Scare Theater put up a combined $11,000 bounty, it still seems unlikely the original will be found anytime soon. But if the lost media community can find the original location of the back rooms, and even everyone knows that in an obscure corn movie, uh, really anything's possible. You know, I wonder if part of what drives so many to want to find the original image is the memory of how terrifying Jeff was to us as kids. That raw terror from seeing something as simple as a bad Photoshop image paired with a really amateur written horror story comes really rare as you get older. It's something a lot of people want to relive, and some talented writers decided to take that task upon themselves by doing a full-on reimagining of Jeff the Killer, trying to recapture the feeling of the original story, creating a new Jeff that would even scare the adult users who now held nostalgia for the old story. Let's start off with the rewrite by horror YouTuber Pastara. Pastara reimagines Jeff as a more pathetic and even sympathetic figure. In this version, he's college age, and he's already had his burn injuries before anything bad happens, coming from a freak fire at his family home. He has a weak, dorky, almost childlike voice that does a lot in making him creepy. It'll be all right, Lou. When you next wake up, we're gonna see mom and dad again. Just go to sleep. This iteration of the tale has a unique retrospective framing. The first half follows the classic rough hardened cop with an unprofessionally enthusiastic rookie, cracking the case of a mysterious, disfigured man in a white hoodie who's been attacking and murdering random civilians in the city. We hear interviews recounting three different tales where Jeff approaches random people, seeming to think that they're Lou, only to be enraged and attack them when they don't recognize him. It makes it seem like Jeff is more of a mentally broken man, simply looking for his brother, rather than a malicious, indiscriminate killer. The sympathy angle is kept up till the halfway point where the officers interview Lou at his home and he gives the full rundown on Jeff's origin. Here we see the retake of the original story. In this version, Jeff is bullied by the tree guys over his appearance, as we're shown his burns are something he's really self-conscious of. It fits really cleanly and justifies the bullying without needless exposition. It also reframes Jeff's first kill as self-defense, with Randy's death by the hands of Jeff being merely an allegation. Assuming how you don't already know how it goes, you could believe Jeff is merely misunderstood, and all the suffering he endures is purely to blame by the fire that was totally out of his control. But that all changes when near the end, Lou feels Jeff was the one who set the fire in the first place. It wasn't the bullies. It wasn't our dad. It wasn't the fire. It was Jeff. It was always Jeff. Actually, Kino line. Just as the reader is fooled into sympathizing with Jeff, he also tricked his family into seeing him as a victim, all the while he was plotting to finish his family for good out of some twisted perversion of love. And there's cohesion in the reason he continues to kill others is the same motivation from before the story began, wanting to finish Lou off for good, or then offing himself so his family can reunite in the afterlife. Pretty cool. You know, everything just cleanly links together in this version, from his burnt out eyelids having fucked his vision to the point where those he kills are people he mistakes as Lou. And I also enjoy Lou being positioned as a hero in this version, giving you someone to root for in the latter half of the story. It seems like a simple thing, and it is, but this makes you realize how lacking the original story was in that aspect, and it really fleshes the whole thing out. The story concludes after Lou tells the cops Jeff's story. Now with the full context of his depravity, we finally see the two meet after they leave, with Jeff raiding in Lou's closet, and the story fully concludes with the two getting into an understated skirmish, ending with both of them about to plunge a knife and box cutter respectively into each other's throats, ending on a cliffhanger. 
So yeah man, really cool and refreshing take after everything else we went over. It seems people are very positive on this one too, and it's definitely the best written story we've gone over so far. Although I think the whole cops interviewing people, which takes up like the whole first half of this already really long pasta, could have been cut down, as after the first one you kinda get the point and I really don't think any of these characters besides Chef and Lou are particularly engaging or fleshed out enough, especially for how long we spend with the cops that have ultimately no impact on the story. This Chef is pretty creepy, although that starts to fade for me with how much screen time he's given throughout this thing. A little more strength would have gone a long way, again by cutting down all those interviews or at least keeping him more mysterious in the first ones. Overall I'd say it's a great horror thriller story with awesome narration as well, but I think it strays a bit too far, especially tone wise, to be the perfect chef to killer story. The Morgue Files Rewrite I'll say it right now, we're finishing with my favorite thing to come from the Jeffy verse. The Morgue Files is an ongoing horror anthology series on the David Near YouTube channel, essentially being a creepypasta cinematic universe where everyone from Slenderman to Mr. Whitemouth and yes, Jeff the Killer inhabit one weird ass town by the name of Forest Lawn. The second episode is a very creatively liberated retelling of the original pasta. It runs for almost two hours and manages to find a balance between the realism of the other reboots while still keeping the excessive gore, campy tone, and even being genuinely pretty unnerving at times. It utilizes its excessive runtime to really build Chef up, so that by the time the night of murder comes, although we never fully grasp what's going on in his head, the violence feels earned, and works great as a satisfying conclusion to a time with such a twisted and intimidating reimagining of the creepypasta icon. This goes for a more cinematic presentation, foregoing a narrator, for the audio drama format. It actually does a lot for the immersion of the whole experience, with some great voice acting and stomach turning sound effects. Although it does end up with uh, your ears being assaulted by a lot of um, Jeff grunting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess some of you guys would probably like that. In this telling, Jeff is established to be deeply troubled from the start. His parents and family are wary around him, with vague descriptions of an incident where Jeff injured Lou when they were kids. And his characterization takes cues from real world serial killers, giving Jeff an unnervingly apathetic personality. From early in the story, he's seen killing small animals and generally showing little emotions besides gaining a perverse pleasure from harming others, which is something he slowly indulges in more and more to the point of ruining his own as well as his whole family's life. The people around Jeff are aware of his antisocial tendencies, but seem to be either too apathetic or unable to properly help him to things get so bad it's already too late. It's especially sad to see his mom try so hard to help Jeff, until eventually becoming totally despondent with how unhinged he becomes near the end. I appreciate how Jeff's disfigurement is handled in this telling too. This Jeff has albinism, giving a logical reason for his pale skin, and as for the scars, Jeff has multiple run-ins with a gang in the town due to his own hubris, eventually meeting one particularly rough goon with the same perverse joy for cruelty as Jeff has, resulting in him carving a Glasgow smile into Jeff's face, just like he himself has, before setting him on fire to get rid of evidence. Obviously, Jeff survives and he ends up in a hospital like Norm, with this being the event to finally send him completely over the edge. Jeff begins by heading to the gang's hideout to get some also satisfying revenge, before heading back to his own home. His parents are horrified to see the monster Jeff has become, now appearing physically as twisted and disgusting as he is on the inside, wearing the same burnt bloody clothes as he sits in the corner eating raw meat. You get the sense Chef doesn't necessarily want to kill his parents just because, but rather as an act of self-preservation before they call the cops or perhaps to free them from their sad lives largely brought upon by Chef himself. After that, Jeff goes on a crazy spree across the town and it's so insanely brutal and over the top. Oh God, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna curb stomp this bitch. <laughs> I love it, it's really fun, and it's also very much appreciated how he gets arrested as it always bugs me how the other stories have Jeff somehow fade police, despite being basically just some kid with a knife. There's obviously a lot I'm skipping here, this story has great reimagining of Lou as well, incorporating another classic creepypasta icon as a b-plot. Jane is also set up with Jeff having a really creepy obsession with her that does a lot in making this Jeff as disturbing as he is. And overall the slow burn of developing Jeff as well as the rest of his family is something you really have to watch the story yourself to understand. 
Overall, I just feel like this is the only reboot that managed to have both really good writing while also matching the tone and overall appeal of the original story. Overall, this is by far the most fleshed out, most disturbing, and most intriguing version of Jeff we've ever had, probably ever will get, and I can't wait to see the series continue and hopefully see more of Jeff. Some will say that it's dumb to still care about Jeff the Killer. I mean, after all, it's essentially just a very poorly written slasher story and its cultural peak was over a decade ago. But to me, he represents a more simple, innocent time online, when the internet was mysterious, scary, and exciting. And making this video, revisiting all the awesome fan art, animations, and ridiculously ambitious rewrites and spin-offs, really awesome and even inspiring to see something so simple spawn all this great creativity. I know I made some jokes and I was critical of a lot of the stories we went over, but I honestly adored all this stuff. Whether you're writing self-insert fanfiction or creating your own gruesome stories using Jeff, I think it's awesome to see people still care about this little amateur story from so long ago. And seeing Jeff and creepypasta in general regaining popularity recently really makes me excited to see all the great art that's still to come from the community.